Hey, LinkedIn, and welcome back to Business Unusual. This is a live show brought to you by the LinkedIn News team, where we're having a conversation as a community about the changing nature of work. I'm Caroline Fairchild, editor-at-large at LinkedIn, coming to you from my home office here in New York City. National protests against police brutality have put the spotlight on injustices that exist right now in systems across the country. And one of the more controversial systems that is under further review right now is artificial intelligence and the inherent bias that can exist within these systems when they go unwatched. As we increase our reliance on AI to do everything from recommend what we watch on television to the search results we get online to even who we hire, outsized attention needs to be paid to not only how these systems are built, but who is building these systems in the first place. On today's show, we'll speak with two leaders who in their own way are doing what they can to make sure that we're building AI for good. Our first guest is Roy Bahat. He's the head of Bloomberg Beta. He'll join us on the show to discuss how he's been thinking about equity within AI and machine learning since Bloomberg Beta launched more than seven years ago. Bahat will break down how he ensures the investments he is making in the future of work have AI for good in mind. Then we'll hear from Google's XAE. She'll join us. She works in global innovation and strategy for Google. And she'll join us to talk about how Google operates to rid existing bias from AI products used today, but also how they proactively ensure bias does not enter these systems. We'll also get her take on how the current protests across the country are changing the way that tech leaders are thinking about the role that they play to make sure that we're building equitable teams and equitable systems overall. But before we bring on our guests, we want to hear from you. The whole point of this conversation is to have a conversation as a community. So if you're joining the stream right now, thank you so much for joining us. And we want to hear from you. This is a big topic, AI. It's a meaty topic, topic a lot of people have questions on or they don't understand. So if you have questions for our expert experts, please let us know. And how are you using AI right now? What are your concerns? Let us know in the stream as well what your concerns are, and we'll have a conversation about that as well. And with that, I wanted to bring on the head of Bloomberg Beta, Roy Bahat, who's joining us from San Francisco. Hi, Roy. Hi, Carolyn. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for joining us. So Bloomberg Beta, the thesis behind this fund is largely on the future of work. Break down for us how AI comes into play with some of the startups that you're investing in and what you're thinking about right now. Sure. So we're an early stage VC. We back startups that make the future of work better. And when we started, we had a pretty simplistic idea of what that was, which was just our personal lives, this was seven or eight years ago, we just thought our personal lives have been completely transformed by technology, how we shop, how we connect with our friends, family, et cetera. And our work lives were mostly the same, you know, clicking ugly little boxes and things and using outdated software. And we just thought that would change and catch up. And what we missed was AI, um, which is that a year after we started, um, we realized, in fact, one of my partners realized that um, that the single most significant technological change happening in the world was the ability of software to do something new, which is to predict what human beings might do or what some other system like the weather might do. And Google is a trivial example of that or a difficult to build but trivial to use example of that where they predict where you're going to click. And that prediction has swept through industry after industry after industry. It is the most powerful thing we believe that's ever happened in software. And we're just trying to make sure that it makes our work lives improve for the better. And can you give us a couple of examples of some of the startups that you've invested in who have some sort of AI or machine learning component sure. to break it down for those in yeah, the room? For sure. I'll give two or three examples. So one is when you kind of think AI, you might have science fiction ideas in your head and some of these things sound futuristic, but they're here. I'll give one example, which is a robotics company um, called Cobalt. And what they do is they have a robot that patrols offices at night. So if you can't afford to have a, a human security guard, you might have this robot patrolling. And if it runs into an issue, it radios back to base and some person um, can figure out how to intervene, whether call the authorities or you know just notice that it's nothing or do something like that. Um, a second is a company called Textio, um, and Textio's initial application was job descriptions. You're editing a job description, then you push it out into the world, and you hope that the applicants you get will be high quality, that they'll be diverse, et cetera. Textio actually analyzes past job descriptions that have been used by companies and who actually applied. And the same way a spell check works, it tells you you've made an error. Well, Textio predicts what the results of the words you're writing will be. So change this phrase if you want higher quality applicants. Change this phrase if you want more women to apply, that kind of thing. And so that's one example in writing and another example in robotics of, um, of ways that we can already use AI today. And we've been talking about this topic of AI and making sure that it's equitable for quite some time. I think it was two or three years ago, I moderated a panel that you sat on where we, we discussed this at length as well. 
Talk to me about how the protests and the pandemic have accelerated these conversations. What's going on in the VC world right now? And how do you feel like the conversation is changing to put more of a spotlight on these issues? Totally. I mean, at first, I think we're going to be grappling with these issues for the rest of time. We're still grappling with bias in forms of technology that are much less sophisticated than AI. In fact, it doesn't take technology um, to see awful examples of systemic injustice. So this issue is here and here to stay. I'd say that um, the protests have surfaced the hundreds of years long issues in our country. And all of us, I think, in the business world who are doing our job, and yeah, in tech and in VC and startups in particular, are saying, what do we do to fight this? What do we do to fight racism? What do we do to be part of the solution? And we're starting to see entrepreneurs thinking about solutions that they can use. The number of things that I've seen that are around identifying skills that your employees have that you might not have known um, that they had. So you can promote the right person to just pick one example. And I've done some uh, collaboration um, with the economists, Andy McAfee and Eric Brynjolfsson, who wrote this great book, The Second Machine Age. Their whole view on using people versus machines hinges on the fact that you got to know what your people are capable of doing. So you're seeing some examples like that. And then just in the day to day of like, how many candidates have we interviewed for this role who are black? And asking questions, I mean, every board meeting I've been in since the protests have begun includes what are you doing to fight systemic racism in our country? And it's a question that might have felt too big for a lot of little startups in the past, but now they see every action has to be part of it. So that's been what the protests have done. The pandemic, of course, it also exposed some of those injustices that we need to do something about, but it created new needs and new opportunities. Anytime there's a downturn, the pace of adoption of technology increases because companies get desperate. They need to figure out new things to do. They need to take risks they haven't taken before. And this one is the same, but more so. I mean, all those senior executives said, well, we can't try this way of working, you know, just pick working remotely as an example, because it'll ruin all our processes. Like, okay, now you've been forced to do it. Is it working or is it not? And when it comes to AI and automation in particular, which is to say using machines where otherwise people could have done the job, there are many cases where it's literally just not safe for a person to go do this work. And so, you know, we invested in a company called Ware. Um, that uses drones to count inventory in warehouses. Much safer to have a drone doing that work um, than a person allows people to do things that may be safer for them to do. So you sort of have this desire to introduce AI in new ways. Um, and then, you know, the last thing I'd say is we now have a lot of people thinking, a lot of people in America thinking, what can I do for a living that might be better, more stable and safer than what I was doing before? Uh, there's an anthropologist, David Graeber, and he has this idea that he calls, maybe unhelpfully, but he calls it bullshit jobs. And what he means by that is the kind of jobs where you doing the job, and you know, I'd say probably all of us at some point in our life have felt this way about our job, at least for a moment, you doing the job secretly know that actually your job doesn't really matter to the outcome of whatever the organization is doing. And I think when people shift their environment and go to work from home, both they and sometimes their companies can now see, wait a minute, like we didn't actually need somebody doing that. And so what that creates is this hunger to find new ways of doing work and AI is going to enable lots of them. Right. For those of you just joining the stream, this is Business Unusual. We're having a conversation right now with Roy Bahad. He's the head of Bloomberg Beta, talking about how we can build AI for good and how his investment thesis has changed amid the protest and the pandemic. I want to go ahead and say hello to some members in the stream. Lucas, Kurt, Renee, Marianne, Diane, thanks for joining us. Matthew says, set unbiased parameters and test the data with impartial objective principles. That's how you attempt to unbias AI. Thanks for that perspective, Matthew. We appreciate you joining us on the show. Rory, you, you talk about the questions that you're getting in board meetings about how to fight systemic racism in the country right now. But I wonder, when you're talking to startup founders and you're thinking about investing in the tech that they have behind whatever future of work idea that they have, what questions are you asking them in terms of what, how they're thinking about their building their teams moving forward and to specifically to AI equity, how they're thinking about building the tech behind the platforms that they're building? Yeah. So first, I want to say I wish it were as simple as using unbiased data. I mean, to that comment, if it were that easy, we'd have all done it already. The reality is figuring out where the bias lives it's hard. It takes work and it's work worth doing. So we, in terms of the questions we ask founders, we try to be the most transparent investor. So you can go on our website and you can actually see the list of questions that we might ask you in a first meeting. And one of them is, if you are successful, 
what might the dark underside of that success look like? What might some of the unintended consequences be? And it's not that we're expecting somebody to solve them all on day one, because first they have to focus on making something that works, but we want them to anticipate it. And we've definitely passed on investing in companies where the founders sort of said, well, this is inevitably happening in the world anyway, and I'm better than the other person. So, hey, no big deal. Like we want, we believe that, that companies may fail unless their leaders are responsible at thinking about how their technology fits in our broader society in a constructive way. Eventually, every company has to deal with it. The question is just how painful it's going to be. And we want to work with those founders who are thinking about it. I'll just say one other thing. It's not just about what we ask. It's about which founders we talk to. And so you know, one of the reasons we um, try to speak to under founders from underrepresented um, or underestimated backgrounds whenever we can is we, because we believe that those founders bring a perspective to these issues that's ingrained in how they think about the world because they may have suffered from things that other founders may just not know. They just have an intuitive feel for it that a founder who's come from an environment of more privilege just may not have. So they may build better companies. And as you think about diversifying the portfolio of founders that you're investing in, a lot more people outside of San Francisco, New York, and Boston are thinking about starting companies right now as remote work becomes more and more palatable for companies and, and founders as well. Do you think that this is going to be a boon for the capital that we're going to be seeing outside of the coasts? And what are you seeing right now in terms of just investment thesis and appetite for founders who are just not where we are right now? Yeah, it's been transitioning gradually over the last few years. So less and less money has been on the coasts. We, in fact, wanted to study this trend about the future of work. And so we went and led a group of VCs four times on tours of historically black colleges and universities in the South, two trips to the heartland, one trip to Tulsa um, with members of Congress in what we called the Comeback Cities Tour. And we were there to explore, is this happening? And the answer is, yes, it's absolutely happening. Remote work is a contributor. What we need, in addition to more founders, though, is we need angel investors who know what they're doing. Um, we need professional investors who know what they're doing. And so all these ecosystems have to move at once. We ourselves still believe that our ability to serve founders, we need to be nearby to know how to help them. And so we're ourselves still focused on investing in the Bay Area in New York, but there's plenty of opportunity for lots of other people to take. And I do think they'll back... Um, I do think that they'll back a much more diverse set of founders. In fact, one last thing is my partner, equal partner, Karen Klein, did a study um, together with Techonomy where they asked a bunch of people, whether founder people in the startup ecosystem, whether they thought this present moment would lead to a shift in who's investing in, invested in. And yes, they found everybody expects or the preponderance of people expect will be backing more founders from different backgrounds, racial backgrounds. I think that also includes geographic backgrounds. How systemic will it be? How widespread will it be? That's what's at stake here. I want to go ahead and bring in a comment from the stream, Michael, who's agreeing with what you said earlier. He says, more than ever, this is such a critical conversation and to be thoughtful about looking at the data and measuring how representative it is for the scope of its reach impact is even more important. When it takes work, it can be considered a liability. It's a good liability. So, Michael, thanks for bringing in that perspective. Roy, before I let you go, in terms of long-term impacts of this pandemic, do you think in, in the conversation that we have around AI and how it's built, how is the conversation going to change? You know, I started this conversation telling you that we've been talking about this for years. We know the bias exists. How will this conversation be different, say, in five years, or what are your hopes? Great question. So I don't know. Here's my hope. Um, because anybody, you know, we're terrible at making predictions. What I believe is that the kinds of founders who will build companies will come from much different backgrounds and therefore have different ideas. And of course, if anybody who's listening to this is starting a company and wants to go to our website and check out how to work with us or know somebody talented, please do. But the other thing that I think will happen in that is AI used to be a priesthood. It used to be somebody, I remember an email five or 10 years ago that somebody sent and they said, there's probably only a hundred people in the world who know how to develop new AI methods and only a thousand people who know how to use them. Whether or not that was true then, the number is going to be 10, 100, or 1,000 times that in five years. And so that wide variety of perspectives means we're going to have a very different conversation. You're going to have kids hacking on stuff at home using AI. You're going to have retirees thinking about their third business using AI. And so I think we're just going to see a much more varied conversation. And what I'm open to is less like, here's how I think it's going to go, and more the surprise of not knowing what's next and wanting to hear from folks like the folks watching this show. Well, Roy, I echo that hope as well. And thank you so much for joining us on Business as Usual. As always, I appreciate your insights. It's been great to talk. Thank you. 
That was Roy Bahat. He's the head of Bloomberg Beta, joining us to talk about how his investment thesis around AI has changed amid the protests and the pandemic. I want to thank him for joining us on the show. And now I want to bring on another leader who's tackling AI for good from within. She's Google's XIA. She's joining us from, where are you right now, X? Uh, Los Angeles based. She's joining us from Los Angeles. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on today's show. I already see a lot of members in the stream eager to speak with someone who's from Google. It's a product that we all use every day. I'm using it right now. What are you currently working on for, for Google? Talk to us a little bit about your role and how you got into Google to work on AI for Good. Okay, sure. So at Google, I am the global outreach lead for a team called Responsible Innovation. We're focused on ensuring that Google's algorithms across the board, uh, whether they're algorithms that are inside of our products, whether it's algorithms that we're developing through research, or companies that have algorithms that we're in the process of acquiring, are in alignment with our AI principles. Um, even though they were released in a blog post, Google's AI principles are far from a marketing campaign. They're actually our ethical charter that determines how we will and will not build, develop, purchase, acquire, and research artificial intelligence. So my job is to work with a whole bunch of different product areas across Google, as well as key industry partners, as well as uh, different uh, organizations that we partner with to ensure that we're popping the Google bubble and creating a larger feedback loop to ensure that we can operationalize those principles. Now, I, I don't want to come off like a superhero. There's definitely a team of us. In fact, there's more than 300 people at Google who are dedicated to doing this full time. Um, so it's, it's a massive effort to ensure that all of our artificial intelligence that we build and use is done in a way that is ultimately good for society and that it doesn't do things like scale or reinforce unfair bias, making sure that it doesn't do things like uh, violate people's privacy, that it's not introducing new security concerns, things like it's not harming uh, our users through violations of uh, widely accepted norms and international policy on certain uh, use cases. So I love what I, um, I actually came from Microsoft where I was uh, building a whole bunch of different artificial intelligence algorithms uh, for industry customers to try to help them innovate in like smart environments. How do we like automate factories? How do we make things um, need less humans involved, right? And in that, I uh, had an opportunity to come to Google specifically to work on this problem, which is instead of me thinking about how to build algorithms to sell, how do we build algorithms to serve? Mm. And you talk about to serve. One of the reasons why I wanted to have you on the show is I found your background to be so interesting. You had a stint in the Army before going in-house to Google. Talk to me a little bit of work about your work in the Army and how it led you to be on the corporate side of this data mix that we're talking about right now. Yeah, sure. So um, I, when I was in the Army, uh, I joined the California Army National Guard when I was very young. I was a student in Berkeley and joined initially as a vehicle mechanic and very quickly realized uh, I didn't want to change tires for the rest of my life. So I switched over to a role in the military's intelligence unit. I was deployed to Afghanistan where I served a, uh, amongst a whole lot of great leaders. While I was there, I, I was at the headquarters of special operations for the US, ISAF, and NATO, which is a whole lot of jargon to say. All the special operations commands in the world who were working to um, cohesively come together to combat uh, the forces that were fighting against. And while I was there, a lot of my job focused very heavily around data, around how we use data to do operational planning, how we collected data, around analyzing the quality of data that we received. And obviously, that was a very different environment than just machine learning, uh, where you're collecting maybe public data sets out of research or paying people to put your data sets together. These were like intelligence data sets where people were going out and collecting the intelligence on the ground. And while I was there, I mean, I just had some really great mentorship from folks who came from all walks of life, from every side of the military, who were able to help me build my technical skills to a different level. So I came into Afghanistan basically building websites, and I left Afghanistan able to build algorithms, able to you know do a lot of security stuff in computers. And when I transitioned back over to the civilian world, that experience carried a lot of weight with corporate companies. So being able to transition out of the army and coming back into society, I was able to very quickly find that a lot of those same skills, even though the environment had changed, applied to corporate environments where folks were looking to solve very complex problems, ensure that the data that they were using for their uh, solutions was, was valid, it was high quality. So it was very easy to kind of transition back over. Of course, with the support of great mentors that I met through LinkedIn. <laughs> and of course, we're having this conversation now under the backdrop of national protests against police brutality mm -hmm. and systemic racism, which is bringing this conversation of AI to the forefront. How have the protests impacted the work that you're doing at Google right now? What are conversations within Google currently, given the backdrop of what's going on in the country? 
Well, I'm sure um, I, I would encourage everyone to go look at Sundar's recent commitment uh, around Google's approach to racial equity. Not only have we committed tons of, of resources, money, and commitments to change a lot of our processes internally, just around the way that we treat each other as employees, we've also been doing a lot of work across the board to uh, across almost all of our product areas to take a hard critical look at the areas where we can improve to ensure that our algorithms are less biased out of the gate. And when I say less biased, I want to be clear. Every algorithm in the world is going to be biased because it's created by humans. And we're the ones who choose the data sources, where we gather the data to train the models. We actually train the models. And then when we're done, we're those who use them. So bias can happen at any point in that process. It's not just at the data set collection point. It's also about analyzing and ensuring we understand what the algorithm is learning. Is it learning the associations that we want? And then also about how users feel when they use the system at the end of the day. A great example of that is facial recognition. If we were to have facial recognition algorithms, which Google as a part of our AI principles explicitly does not do, um, but if let's just say hypothetically, the world adopts a facial recognition algorithm that's so accurate that it can tell identical twins apart. The chances that everyone in the world would agree that that's a fair use case of the technology are slim to none. And because of that, bias is not just a data set problem or an algorithmic problem. It's also a perception challenge. How do people feel when they use the system? Does the system feel fair to them? And at Google, uh, one thing that I'll say is a lot of the recent protests have allowed us to open up conversations in a more honest and transparent way, allowed us to take a much higher level look at different escalations within our products, as well as take a, a stance around what can we do differently from the start, as opposed to once we built the algorithm and seen it, uh, you know, deployed in an environment and maybe you're getting feedback about it, how can we intentionally start designing in a way to where we're trying to include more users at the beginning of the process or different users at the beginning of the process to ensure that when we're thinking about whether or not an algorithm may potentially harm a group of people, that those people are represented in the decisions around whether or not it's harmful and that they have a say in helping us shape how we mitigate those harms. Mm -hmm. So it's been a huge shift collectively in terms of collaboration across the company so product areas are not just working in silos to fix their own problems within their own product. We're now sharing resources. We're collaborating. And part of my work stream at Google, I lead a coalition of 16 different teams that has different elements to keep our values true, which are, you know, respect the user, respect the opportunity, uh, as well as Google um, core values around uh, building for everyone. So each of these 16 full-time teams contributes something a little bit different to how we do that. And now we've been able to build executive relationships across the company. We're figuring out how to make that UX a little bit easier for the product teams. But I will say that the recent protests, um, in the words of a really good friend of mine, uh, Thomas Flyer, who does a lot of work with our ERGs, it's like the world woke up and realized racism was real. And so in that, there's been um, not just a push to get things to move forward in a way that is more conducive Conducive and more helpful and more useful for our users, but in a way that also is allowing us to accelerate uh, a lot of these changes uh, much quicker than we would have before, which I'm sure a lot of folks are seeing. Right. I want to go ahead and bring in a comment right here from Michael who says, just because an algorithm's analysis is based only on data doesn't mean its outputs will be neutral or objectively fair. It's quite common for human biases to be reflected in our data. So Michael, thanks for bringing in that perspective. And actually, I wanted to ask you, I have a question here from Heather, who's actually, she's asking about just the diversity of the people who are working on AI to begin with. A recent analysis mm -hmm. of LinkedIn data found that on the platform globally, 82% of LinkedIn members with the skills to even work on AI are male. I'm sure that those numbers are even worse for people of color, given what we know about skills in the industry. Tell me a little bit about what can be done to diversify and make sure that the inputs that are going into this data and who's building on them to begin with are equitable and fair and represent a ton of different backgrounds like Roy was discussing earlier in the show. Right. OK, I think that's awesome. Um, so first and foremost, the people who are the mechanics or the engineers who are plugging the data into the machine learning algorithm, we know generally in computer science that there is a lot of disparities, whether it be between folks from different income levels, folks from different areas of the world, folks from different gender identities, or even different racial ethnic identities and different ability levels, um, just as those challenges are reflected in larger computer science areas. So I can't I don't want to propose and say that I have the whole solution for everyone, but I can give you guys some insights based on what we've done at Google. The first is that we try to take a mindset um, of a phrase that came about in the disability rights movements of the, I think it was like 10, 20 years ago, probably 30 years ago. Um, and the disability rights movement slogan is that nothing about us without us. 
And that doesn't mean that the folks who are involved in crafting those systems have to literally be the machine learning engineers who are feeding the data into the system. But that as often as possible, how can we ensure that the folks who are going to use the system at, on the uh, you know, at the end of the day or be impacted or affected by the system have a say in the way that we're shaping and designing it. So at Google, we've gotten creative. We have tons of different ways that we collaborate to ensure that we have the right feedback at the right moment from the right groups of people to try to mitigate and reduce some of those biases up front. Some of that work is done um, internally. So uh, one of my colleagues, Annie Jean-Baptiste, has a group of uh, inclusion champions that has over three thousand Googlers from diverse backgrounds who commit to do things like spend some of their spare time, their 20% time coming in and contributing and giving feedback directly to product areas from their lived experience, not just as Google employees. Now, obviously, Google employees don't represent the whole world. So we do tons of testing externally with different user groups. We have partnerships with groups like AdColor, Black in AI, Latinx in AI. We also support thought leadership and feedback through partnerships with research institutions where we invite leading researchers from all over the world to come in and comment on the different types of things that we're working on in terms of artificial intelligence. And we always, uh, uh, in addition to that, we always strive to make sure that the ways in which that we build leverage diverse expertise. So if we're just building computer science systems and all we have is computer science TIS doing that, we miss the opportunity for the deeper understanding of societal context. So we also consult with experts across race, across gender. We have research scientists at Google who, who, who are um, sociologists, not computer scientists. We also focus on bringing in folks from different disciplines within the engineering space. So what does it mean to have a fair UX? or user experience, the way that it looks and feels around artificial intelligence? What does it mean to market artificial intelligence in a way that feels fair, in terms of the way that we talk about the product, in terms of the way that we promote education around the product? So I think a lot of it is to, and of course, I don't wanna say that we're perfect, we're a company, we're striving, and every day we don't uh, say that there, you know, fairness is the end goal. A lot of what we try to do is make sure that it's a continuous priority, so that just as much as society is changing, just like, cyber threats or what can you know how someone can hack to your system is always changing that we're always shifting our processes to reflect the ever needing uh, ever um, evolving uh, needs of society and i'm seeing some comments in the stream right now people echoing your thoughts michael says i hope one day tech people connotation means more than just programmers and engineers sociologists psychologists ethicists all the people that google is tapping into to focus on these problems so thanks for that perspective x so much of this conversation has been talking about ai for bad but i want to hear about ai for good these systems they have so much potential to help society for those on the stream who want to get a taste, feel a little bit better, a little bit creepy, less creepy deepy about what's going on with AI right now, give us a sense of what some of the positive things you're seeing come out as these technology systems continue to take over different parts of the world and bring kind of this equity landscape into them. Yeah, absolutely. So I think as much as we've seen all the boogeyman around how the artificial intelligence can maybe reinforce different biases like computer vision systems or which are cameras that are taught to see people um, don't necessarily work well for folks with darker skin. So there's a lot of boogeyman in the world of artificial intelligence. But the reason why we at Google are so committed to continuously pursuing this technology despite its risk is because of its immense amount of benefits. One of my favorite examples of this is an app that we have at Google called Read Along. And Read Along, basically what it does is it uses um, speech to text and uh, voice technologies or automated speech recognition, which is teaching a computer system how to hear different types of speech patterns that takes, um, it's basically a reading tutor for youth who are struggling to learn how to read. So a youth can pull open the Read Along app, they can read into it, and then it will coach them in real time and give them feedback on their reading level. Imagine in a, in a country where we have so many different systemic disparities within our education system, being able to open up an app, you personally engage with it, and then be coached into having your literacy level improved without having to go to the right schools, having the right tutors, having the right access to money, living in the right neighborhoods. It's something that becomes accessible right within your phone. That's one very small example at Google. We also have done a lot of work in the medical space where we've used artificial intelligence to help doctors identify cancer in both the breast 
and the lung. And these algorithms are more accurate than the doctor's own human eyes. Um, in addition to just positive use cases of artificial intelligence that have positively impacted society, and feel free to go check out Google. Uh, at Google, we have something called AI for Social Good, which you can go check out. There's a slew of initiatives that we have going on within our own company, as well as initiatives we funded externally. We also use artificial intelligence in order to help us understand where in society uh, we may not be holding ourselves up to par in terms of fairness. So in places where there's not algorithms being used, for example, in media. We have a, a, a whole department at Google within Google Research and um, a system that we have, we call it Codename Oakley. And what it does is it uses machine learning to analyze media content, to understand the representation within the media content. So uh, we did a study back in 2016 with the Gina Davis Institute at USC. We also, uh, the following year in 2017, did a study with YouTube where we analyzed over 2 million ads to understand gender disparity in, the, in advertising. So um, how much were women represented versus men? If it, was a vid if it was video content, how much did the women speak versus the men? How much were they physically present on the screen versus men? And we're currently evolving that system to do things like evaluate for different types of skin tone representation. What skin tone are represented? How much are they represented? So not only can these tools literally tackle some of these systemic disparities directly, doing things like helping us diagnose cancer, helping us ensure that we all have access to the same level of uh, social mobility within society, right, by being able to do things like read. Um, but also they're, they're out there to help us understand how our current constructs, uh, such as media, the stories that we tell ourselves, can also have bias within them as well. So I hope that's a, a good snapshot into some of the ways that even though there are all these boogeymen out there, how this technology can also empower us as a society to see ourselves better and to change the things that we see that we don't like. It's a great overview. And I've seen a lot of members in the stream appreciative for that. Shirag says AI by nature should be evolving constantly. Biases can change over time as the AI learns. The basic requirement should be that as society changes, it's ideas of bias. The AI should keep up with them. Rhonda says there's a lot of work that can be done. Organizations just need to leave the status quo behind. So X, thank you so much. I know I speak for the stream when I say we really appreciate you joining us on Business Unusual and look forward to connecting with you again soon. All right. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Thank you for that was XIA from Google talking to us about how they're thinking about AI for good, not just AI for bad, and how they're ridding current systems of bias and how they think about this within the protest and the pandemic that we're all experiencing right now. This is Business Unusual, a live show brought to you by the LinkedIn News team, where we're having a conversation about the changing nature of work. Tomorrow at 12 Eastern, from the LinkedIn News page, my colleague, Hallie Schweitzer, will be having a conversation with Walmart's chief customer officer. Talk to her about how shopping habits are changing amid the pandemic. She'll also sit down with NYU Scott Galloway to get his take on how the pandemic and the protests are changing digital marketing. Be sure to join here back here on the LinkedIn News page at 12 Eastern tomorrow. I'm Caroline Fairchild. Thank you so much for joining us.